Well, that's welcome to the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. Do you know, I've got to get going and do more jobs. Keep my mind occupied. I'm so pleased when we get over all this lockdown. So here's a few clips to get you guys through the lockdown as well. It's a little bit of, I've got to call it, lockdown lunacy. Well, doubtless you've gathered by the attire. It's cold, it's damp, it's horrible. The old girl's not going anywhere. But I could, I could put it here, look. We've had so much rain. Unbelievable. This is my marina. Totally underwater. I think I'm actually going to have to get my dirty water pump out and get this pumped out. Because before I've had it, there's my fuel tank close to the house. It was over the dustbin. It's dropped a bit, but I might run the pump there today and try and get some of that out. Otherwise, this is going to be launched in that. Almost 11 o'clock in the morning. We've got this thick fog there. I don't know where you guys are going to see it through the fields there. Very, very thick fog. See, the water's all backed up in that field as well. I'm thinking of doing either pumping the pond out, getting angry because I can't use the boat, or, or go down the bottom pond, put my waders on, at least I feel as I'm fishing, and net the bottom pond. It's choked with oak leaves for about two years. And look, this is what Mike's come back from Somerset. He's now living in Hampshire with us. Well, not with us, but he's living in Hampshire. I've got another boat. There we go. A giant green banana. It's nearly as long as my boat. In fact, I'm going to say that's about a 17 foot canoe called a prospector. So whether we're going to get another boat out on the water to catch anything, who knows? I've had some very nasty experiences in Canada in a canoe and I'm not exactly putting my hand up to get in it. There's no engine, no rudder. And I can't make a cup of tea really. Anyway, hopefully I get out with Mike in that at some stage when we get out of this lockdown. I think I'll go and look at that pond, guys. Well, there's probably no telling what I'm going to find down in here. But I feel it's got to be cleared out, and I can see already the old duck weeds on the surface. So I want to get it all cleared out, like, and the silk weed start, and the blanket weed. But it's the leaves on the bottom I want to get rid of. I normally do this around March. I'm going to leave it till uh, later to put any more lilies in here, but I'll get it cleared out ready. I'll put it to pull all my lilies out, if they're still going. So, as they say in goes, in at the deep end. There's tons of it, guys. I mean, I don't even know I'm going to get it all out. Still. Oh my god. This is going to be a labour of love. I'm not. I'll give it a go anyway. I mean, when I got the diggers to dig this out, it didn't really occur to me that it might not be the most intelligent thing to dig a pond underneath two oak trees. But this one, with three oak trees, this one I really have been up with a ladder and make a superb place to build a sort of hide for well, kids. It's about 25 feet up. Well, kids are like me. So I'm going to talk with Mike and maybe we're going to build a little viewing or hunting platform up there. I'm not looking forward to any more of this. It's freezing in there. That is far too many leaves in my pond. I imagine it makes like tannic acid. That's why it's absolutely zero looks like it's living in there. At the moment, at the present time. Just look at the amount I've actually got out of there. 
and that's just half of it. That's just this half. Then around here, I think there's about three years worth of leaves in it to be honest. Another load of leaves. All dead leaves, all dead oak leaves, nothing in it at all. Well, here it is. It's a pot there or a brick or something. I pulled that one out. I've got a couple of uh, lilies in pots here and they've got green shoots showing signs of life. But this is my bad area because it's going to be deeper. More plants I've got to get out. Some have got pots, some haven't. And I figure underneath this oak tree a lot more leaves. Right, let's get in there. Look at the flooding over there. Just so much rain we've had, it's ridiculous. That, that is higher than the level of the pond. So I figured it's not going to get any warmer to do this sort of stuff. This end is going to be out. I can feel by the net on the bottom. Absolutely, yes. I can barely lift it. Oh, that's the net broken again. Got a feel of it, something went. Fishy, 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 fishy. <laughs> what a brave dog he is. Maybe he knocks my camera in the water. Just going to run the net through here once to see what we've got in the bottom. No, there's still quite a bit there. It's going to go clearer. somewhere. There's some leaves just starting to shoot so there's more stones in there the silt. I blame the gardener myself. Well this one's all stirred up I've uh, got some leaves out not many though and I'll put some slate weights around the uh, floating lilies and sunk them down so the frost is going to freeze tonight I think. And if they're floating, it might just kill the roots. So I've got them down on the bottom now. So that one, I can do no more. That's it. Got a monumental heap of leaves out, I have to say. And these are taken really well. They sort of look after themselves. They're great space fillers. You've seen them in our films before, I think. All along here, look, tons of leaves. And these are just uncurling, which obviously I'm going to let all these drain out first back over there. I'm going to let it all drain out before we even go near them because they're so heavy. I think I've done my back again, lifted them out the uh, out of the net. But look at the rain we've had. Unbelievable. Duckweed's going to be a problem. Of course, if you have it clear, you're going to get problems with weed because the clarity makes the weed grow. But just look how much I've got out. It's got to be a help, surely. Right. Onwards and upwards to the next job. I've had to go in and have a shower, guys. I've got so wet and cold, it's ridiculous. So I've got these uh, lilies. They can be just lowered off the side and they'll sink down. And the others are going to have to tie some weights to, like slates, just to get them under the water. Don't laugh if I go in, will you? That's gone down. Best just not to drop them in fast is a, is a secret. I'll have to go in with them. Okay, that one went in fast. <laughs> but ones like these, I've, uh, I've got bits of slate on. So you've got to retie the slate on there and that will sink them to the bottom. This one, believe it or not, is uh, yellow iris. Call it. And sometimes they grow large enough that they will be bigger than the weight that's taking them down. But now I just bring them up, split them up, either give them away or you just have to thin them out.
work, it's pretty back-breaking work. Lifting those wet leaves out in the net is not like lifting a 15-pound carpet. It's just totally heavier. It's wet. It's horrible. Anyway, it's a job they need to do it. I'm pleased it's over. And now I'm getting inside. It's a little bit warmer. Not much, though. A little bit of more lockdown lunacy. Right, next job is a totally awesome freezing workshop. And I've got a little gadget here, which I've had as a present and I've never used. It's called Garden Tool Maintenance Shear and Scissor Sharpen. And I really abuse my shears, chopping down every short trees with it. And I normally just get a filing going along the edge. So I thought, I must try this. So it says you've got to screw it down on a block like this. You screw it onto a block. One size higher than the other there, if you can see that. Asymmetric, I'm calling that. Um, so I'm just going to pinch it in the vise without snapping it. I mean, what I should do is screw it to a piece of wood and then screw the wood into the vise. And then within the instructions it says you get the points and you, you push towards the cutting edges, which I guess are like some carboid things there, and it should work. Now, this could actually save me quite a bit of time. Endeavour to try. I've had a couple of goes pulling it and then read the instruction it said push it. So it lets the blade, I can see why, look if I come backwards I'm trying to cut it aren't I? So this way as I move forwards it actually does push those blades apart. I'm just leaning with my body against it. Now it judders at the tip and that's the tip where I do most of my cutting. So I'm guessing that's sort of ridged in there and that's probably the bit I'm going to need to cut sharper. Down here it goes nice and smooth. I don't probably use it quite as much down there, I'm guessing. Gardening experts tell us. No idea whether it works. Something different. Does scissors as well. In fact, I can see it's working. It's actually taking off metal filings. Just down in there, if I show you, just down in there if I show you, it's got the metal filings coming in, coming off just there, look. If I knock them out of the way, and then go through again, pushing. Get it level. Well, an ingenious invention. That is absolutely all those filings in there. So the shears now, I can see the angle on there. Wow, that is unbelievably sharp. That is definitely a, a piece of equipment that I should have used probably four years ago when I had it for Christmas present. Now, a little bit of oil in here, a bit of WD-40 there and they can go away. But what I'm going to do, I've got that there which I shouldn't have, I'm going to screw this, there you can see the holes, to a block of wood and then I can clamp the block of wood in there. Obviously a piece of pallet wood or scrap wood like that. I've learned something. You can see what's been rubbed in there. A little bit of oil in there. Just work it in a little bit. I haven't got a clue what the oil is. Don't ask me guys. Engine oil probably knowing me. A bit the other way. And I just smear the surplus. Just watch out when you do that because that blade should be really sharp. Let's work it in a little bit. Changing the angle. Oh yeah, that's much, much easier. It's going to save my poor old elbows a lot when I come around to do some more snipping. Right, on to the next job. Don't waste that oil, Graham. I tend to leave it all on there, guys, so it keeps it, uh, keeps it from rusting up. So, being as it's freezing cold out there and I can't go fishing, and the lockdown, we're all going to be suffering from lockdown lunacy. I can see that coming a mile away. It's how lockdown lunacy I am. I'm going to try and make a handle for this hammer. Now, I've got plenty of hammers, but this one, I don't know really what it's for. I think I've cleaned it all off in white vinegar, wire brush, I've done all that business. I think it's a railway sleeper. I think it's for the railwayman. Does anybody know that shape there? There is some writing on it. I'm going to tell you that in a second. But the fact it's got this here, taper, whatever they call that, I so people out there will tell us what that taper is. 
I think that's for driving some sort of wedging on a railway line, I'm guessing, and then the track runs along here, the sleeper's there. If the bolt or whatever it is they hammer in here is too close to the sleeper, the head can't hit it. So it needs a narrow piece, and I'll tell you why. Let's go into it. Something else I'll show you in a minute. This hammer, it's a tack hammer. And the reason being, if you have tiny tacks you upholstery, which I used to do when I had furniture shops, you go out, 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 out. This way you spin it round and the taper just goes between your fingers. So, in other words, that's a narrow gap. And I'm figuring, when you look at it, now that way over, way, way bigger, obviously. The, the, the taper, that was the right way around, wasn't it? Smith, stop it. There, you can see the taper, pretty much the same. Let's see if we can see the writing on here. Somebody and sons, and one of you guys I feel sure out there, of senior or vintage years might be able to cast some light, it's light on it. It's definitely been used a lot, it's been hammered round here. Right, it's got writing along here. It says Nash and Sons, and I think that's a two. Now, it wouldn't be two kilos because it's an old one. I feel that is going to be two pounds. I'd like to catch a roach as heavy as that, put it like that. So, what I'm going to do is this I've got a piece of seasoned cherry wood there that I've stripped all off. It is as hard as a rock. I've got to get it down to go into that hole there, so it's got to have a lot off it. I'm figuring I'm going to saw down here first, saw down there. I do as much as I can with the saw first, and then Mike's dropped in my letterbox his world famous, totally awesome outdoors draw knife, which has never been sharpened and is still very sharp. It's a bark stripping. But it's a draw knife that you pull towards you, I'll show you in a minute. He just told me, he said, don't you dare sharpen it. I wouldn't, it's pretty sharp as it is. It's a bit of clean off there because it's got the uh, the tar off all the pine he's been stripping. I noticed the par pine sticks there. Right, let's get saw in and see if I can cut the surplus off of this. I told you I was bored, we're all bored. I've got to do something. Oh yeah, it's hammer time.
think that wedge is going to be too wide for that. So I'm wondering if I can cut this wedge in half. Because what you do is drive this into the head of the wood here, it splits it apart and pinches into the outer casing of the metal, pushes it apart. Let's try and see if we can uh, see if I could just split that down. Now I don't know how long the handle on this should be. I have a feeling it should be longer than this because they, you know, more leverage. But I don't exactly have power lifters' hands, do I? You know, wrists at my age. So I'm figuring a shorter, slightly shorter shaft, you know, should give me all the uh, leverage I need because I'm losing the weight of the head. But what I want to do is, I'll, sometimes you want to choke a hammer up here. Now that, that's where it feels sort of balanced for me, is look, that sort of length. So it might give me some bank line, I'm going to go up this shaft here, just a bit of decoration really, and a bit of grip, gives me a bit of a grip more than anything, but see what it looks like, and then I can put some maybe some uh, boiled linseed oil over that. But it's looking pretty much like a hammer now. So if I go with this bank line, I'll call it a bank line, but this is the slippy one, I like the wax one, might get a, a sort of wax one, so when you cinch down and pull a knot up, it stays tied. This is a, uh, a fairly slippy sort of paracord, I'm not a lover of paracord, I have to say. I know it's very, very strong, that always parachutes up and all the army use it and whatever, but I'm not a lover of it. So, the steel all might called here. I'm going to start, just so I would, with a tag line up there, right, and just start the whip over this, going over that tag line. I don't need to be right near the edge, I don't need to be all, you know, super duper tight. And then I figure I'm going to probably cover that and bed some glue in there as well. Might be better doing this in a vice, Graham. Get more leverage. Putting it touching turns. I've got it locked around my hand here. I'm pulling it really, really tight. I just feel that's going to give me a bit more grip because it's a heavy, a heavy hammer, you know, like two pounds or so. That's pretty heavy. So I'll finish off, we're using, we call it a whip finish, we use it on flies. And you can use it actually whipping uh, rod rings. I just make a little loop like that. Hopefully you guys are seeing this. I don't know, let's turn this camera around. Cut off about there, right? And you push this through that loop. I've no idea where this is work. This is an experiment for me as well. And then I'm going to pull this loop back through and bring the tag end out. If I can do it, I will do. There we go. Now this one has to be tight as well. As tight as I can get it. I'm hoping this one will pull right through there. Yeah, it's going to go, but before I do that, I'm going to snip the end off there. And then that should pull through. Come on, babe. Got it. So I've got a tiny little tag there. I can cut it or leave it, but basically, You see under there? I think what we're going to do is run a little bead of that glue around top and bottom um, just to seal it a little bit and then a bit of linseed oil on the wood, on the cherry wood and that should do it. Just going to spray a bit of adhesive along the edge of that knot both ends 
find I stick myself to the hammer. I've coloured it down with some wood stuff as well so that it's not going to be a work of art. Is it going to be functional? Let's get a bit of linseed oil on the handle. Let's get a little bit of this on there, we don't need much. I'm going to put some on the base there. A little bit up here. I've coloured it down as you can see. Got a strange smell about it. The old linsey oil. We used to put it in putty years ago. Mix it with putty and uh, make the putty more pliable. So there we go guys. I've coloured it down. It is. And there we go. one hopefully refurbed hammer with the grip there's only one thing we need to do and just see if it punches a nail in one hammer one giant four inch nail let's see if it'll go in no problem that's just letting the weight of the hammer fall I'll show you that's not swinging it hard that's just Look, just let it, the weight of the hammer fall. I'm not hitting it hard at all. You want me to hit it hard? Stupid Graham. <laughs> the hammer's good, but now I can't get the nail out without cutting the wood apart. Guys, it drove it right the way through that four inch board. One hammer, refurbed, and it will do many jobs for me for many years to come and tell us in the comments page what do you think that shape hammer is used for well I tell you what, I was pretty pleased with that hammer look I'm just a regular ordinary guy DIYing for the last 50 years that's right, you'd think I'd have learnt something, wouldn't you? Anyway, the next best thing to doing all my jobs around here in a property is going out with the camera at dusk and seeing if I can get any wildlife shots. Now, if you're very, very careful, you can get to see deer. And I got really lucky the other evening, creeping along, oh my God, there's a deer. And as I froze, of course they seen me, heard me, smelt me, I'm a clumsy human. But what I did find was difficult moving without treading on a tweak because you have to look down like this to see what you're treading on they see that movement as well they're not stupid and then I saw another and another and another I got quite good shots I'm quite pleased with it I think I should be on TV with these shots
while out with a camera hunting for the deer and that's what you're doing you're shooting without a gun you're shooting with a camera it's quite fun I enjoyed it but I got very very lucky because there is a deer that we have in the UK called the Muntjac deer Mike had a very close encounter one with Jacks and he said they've got tusks and it's trying to rip into Jack or something there's a big melee of this Muntjac trying to attack Jacks Jacks is trying to attack like Jack Russell's do he'll attack Anybody that's in this circumference when he's wound up, that's what Jack Russell's are like. It could be four Alsatians, he's bring it. That's a Jack Russell for you. Anyway, I know they are, you know, dangerous if we get close with these little fangs or teeth or whatever they've got, who knows. And they've got horns as well, of course. But I got lucky. I just saw a glimpse of something going through the bushes. But what's that? Trying to get close to it was really unbelievably tricky because they are known to be quite secretive solitary deer they're not like the previous deer i think they were fallows somebody tell us but they look like fallows to me could be roe deer slack on the hand if they are graham oh what i say is hang on okay smith they could be fallows or roe deer or maybe even red deer thanks for that smith got me off the hook i was pleased to get this and i got quite close to it but basically all i did was as soon as he saw me I just froze, I didn't try and get closer. I went on full zoom and a couple of shots I did get for a few seconds, I go to the software and pull it even closer. And they got quite a pretty face and some nice markings. So, this is a muntjac deer. Quite unusual to get them on camera, I don't know, I've not seen many of them that close. I'm gonna go out hunting them again. They are the ultimate challenge. So I know it's only short footage, but hopefully I can get out there and get some more different species of deer. We'll see you guys in the next one. Gonna be I've got loads, guys. I've got loads of films rammed with fish, but I'm just holding, I'm chilling, I'm laying back, keeping cool, wait till the weather's a bit better for you guys to get out there as well, and then boom, I'm gonna put them up. Mind you, I'm gonna start watching them myself now because there's so many fish in some of them. We'll see you guys next time it won't be long coming i assure you because i am clearing out my hard drives i'm finding loads of interesting lockdown stuff see you next time